Oh, we're live now. G'day, guys. Uh, we're here with Bill, Reese, and Alex from Documentary Now. And I just want to ask you all first, what was it like to get uh, that Emmy nomination in the Variety Sketch Series category? That was, that was really nice. Yeah. yeah it was, it was surprising. Very surprising. Yeah, it was a big surprise. Um, Andrew Singer, our producer, just texted us. Yeah. No phone call. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get a phone call, just a text. It just said, documentary now! Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. And we, I just went, okay, yeah. I think that was it. it. There was no explanation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a documentary now exclamation. I was like, right, Andrew, that's the show we all work on. Very nice. And kind of put it down and went about my day. And then it wasn't until, uh, you know, I more text came in that I realized what it was about. Yeah, it's cool. You're like, you've, you've put too many exclamation marks at the end. It's usually this one. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, and this, what do you guys think about this category? It's a new category at the Emmys. It's its second year um, around. Do you like there's now this category to sort of shine a light on uh, sketch-based comedy? I, I also did not know it was only the second year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think it's kind of great. Yeah, I think it's cool because there's more sketch shows kind of coming out, and it is its own. Having now worked on other shows, uh, like just you know comedy shows that are not sketch and more right. narrative shows, it is a different way of working. You know, so it is much modular. And um, no, but I think it's great. And when you start submitting or considering submitting, and you have to make this decision, you know, well, is this going to be a, are we a, are we a comedy, uh, like a half hour comedy? Are we a, you know, it is nice to have a, a category that seems to fit our show a little better. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, uh, Alex, you're one of the only people working on the show that has not worked on Saturday Night Live before documentary now. Yeah. I, I actually worked on Saturday Night Live before us. Yeah, before we did. Yeah, he's in there forever. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was a different name. <laughs> uh, I started there in 1999. Oh, uh, my gosh. I've been the, the director of photography for the film unit. Um, so I worked for these guys uh, and then preceded them by a few years. But no, we've actually all been working together for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. So, I was the PA when I met Alex. <laughs> Really? Okay. So what is it like, um, like what skills do you transfer from a show like uh, SNL to documentary now? And what about it's a completely different sort of beast? Uh, well, you know, at SNL, um, every, we, Alex and I specifically sort of came from the film unit. So, uh, you know, we were also sort of producing films on a three day schedule every week. Um, so, you know, for us at least, on, on that sort of technical level, um, you know, you learn to, to make decisions quickly and, and, and sort of work within, you've always got confines of time and, and budget to deal with. So, uh, and, and you're doing a completely different thing every week. So, sort of that adaptability is, you know, they're, they're all sort of lessons and, and speed because, you know, the budget on the show is, is, um, is makes it an ambitious uh, project to start with because we're doing unique films um, for each episode. So, uh, it, you know, it sort of taught us to sort of have that ability to sort of be flexible and uh, amount to that. But, you know, I think for a performer, like Bill, it's a, a different version of that. Yeah, you're not performing. as well. At SNL, you had to perform, you know. It was always play to the back row kind of thing, whereas... Uh, Documentary now, it's more acting, it's more nuanced, you know. It's funny because I, in this season, I play a version of James Carville in the Bunker episode, which is, uh, um, his name's, the character's name is Teddy Redbones, but it's essentially James Carville from the War Room. And playing him in this show, as opposed to how I played him in SNL, is totally different ways of acting, you know. It's almost like two different characters, you know. Yeah. Alex? <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, some of the skills that you, Reese and I developed at SNL for years and years, uh, being able to very quickly 
recreate a lot of different kinds of looks. And our show is kind of unique in that every single episode is you know very very different. It's a different world, different characters, uh, different styles. Certainly, like that background has helped make this transition much easier. I mean, I, it, what it feels to to me like we're doing sort of the best version of what we ever did at SNL, but we get to do it for a, an entire episode. So you 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 got you know, 20 plus minutes, whereas at, at SNL, it was always, you would build this whole world and then you get to be there for two minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's such a joy to be able to like tell a whole story in a, you know, kind of a, a full yeah. story, which we, you know, at SNL, we always learned to like, how about the trailer version of that story? <laughs> so this is pretty satisfying. Yeah, it's two minutes. It's, and it is, I guess, to what Bill was saying and to Alex, like the, the, there's a nice sort of freedom and there's a different rhythm of, of comedy that in documentary now that there's not, you know, on SNL, you had two minutes to try and get as usually get as many jokes in as you as you could and and keep the energy up. Whereas here, we can sort of really play with that and not there's not that pressure to sort of yeah you know, sort of really find those laughs and, and you can sort of let the story breathe more. It's also, I mean, it's a pretty it's pretty incredible having at SNL you have about twelve hours of post production time, uh, and here we've got you know a few weeks, so you really can think about the episode and try things and show cuts to, you know, Bill and the guys and have them give us notes. And you just never have that ability. That's now you just cut it. And as soon as it's done, it goes onto the air. Mm. And so this has a, a, a sense of refinement that you just are never allowed. That's now. Yeah. It's almost like with a documentary. Now you're making a 22 minute sketch as well. well I, I think, well, a sketch always kind of implies that it's all about jokes mm -hmm. and kind of hitting mm -hmm. jokes and kind of hitting at the at best a nice a satirical idea. I feel like these are more stories, you know, it's, it's you know, hitting, you know, yeah. uh, the beginning, middle, and end, and you're following uh, an emotional arc of something, which is something we, you know, we're saying, like, well, where is this person at emotionally? We would rarely say that at SNL because... You only have you know like working with five minutes, so it's kind of just a quick idea that you're um, kind of trying to make you know light of or you know something. We try to think of these as, as and this might sound pretentious, but you know films versus sketches um, that you sort of really have to have a clear sense of a beginning, middle, and end. And because they're documentaries too, the the worlds of those stories need to be a lot more fully fledged than. You know, when you are really trying to sell the concept, you know, with a sketch and get people on board as quickly as possible for the, for the, you know, humor to come through. Yeah, sketches can just end. Mm -hmm. We realize that. <laughs> yeah, we realize that really easily. You would just go, oh, we could just stop talking, and then the sketch ends. <laughs> <laughs> just pumping a pool side. Yeah, you just pumping a pool side. Like, oh, that was it. Right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you can't do that on uh, this show. Bill, from season one, what sort of emotional arc or story are you most sort of proud of? Um, probably the Blue Jean Committee, the last episode we did. Um, we had this kind of this moment with me and Fred. I mean, we really made it. Initially came from this documentary, The History of the Eagles. And as we were doing it, and I was seeing what Fred was doing with his character, and I, what I was doing with my character, and then it was really interesting to kind of, I mean, it was written this way, but it felt even more organic. Mm -hmm. I felt like the way these two guys, you felt, um, you kind of cared about them in an interesting way. And, and that my character actually felt some legitimate guilt for what he did to Fred's character. And it all culminates in this really awkward kind of moment that felt very real and it wasn't like let's try to put a joke in there even though we kind of do the wine cooler thing but yeah i don't know if you know the scene but me and fred see each other in the hallway post uh, winning the uh, rock and hall of fame award and uh and it's just like the kind of conversation you have with someone i mean i don't know what the direction was i don't remember i think we just uh because there wasn't it was i think we had the more the conceit of what that scene was but it wasn't as you guys just sort of, it was, you guys performed that uncomfortable dialogue. I feel, I, I, my, my memory is that there was, we allowed it to be more of a natural moment than there was like specific lines to hit. It yeah. was just kind of like, it was like they see each other, it's awkward, and I give him some wine coolers. Like that's what it said in the script. And yeah. Fred and I kind of, and, and, and it's the best stuff, you know, I always feel comes from not overthinking it and 
not thinking, well, this is the moment we got a nail. Like, mm -hmm. We just did it very honestly. And I think we broke for lunch right after that. And I think that's what Fred and I were thinking about while we were shooting that scene. <laughs> it was like, ooh, after this, we go to lunch, <laughs> you know? And then we watched it, and the way these guys cut it together and made it, it, uh, it really affected people. And I think it, it was a nice thing that, to see articles and, and, and you know, critics uh, and they were like, whatever, you know, Vulture, I mm -hmm. think, wrote a really great piece of almost about just the ending and kind of like, oh, you can do these in comedy shows. You know, this show yeah. can, be, can have that these guys met in sausage school, which is insane, <laughs> you know? Uh, you can have these ideas and make it this in this style and still make it about people, you know? And yeah. not feel corny or shoehorned in or anything like that, so. I that think that's also a really good example of, you know, I, I think for Reese and I, a lot of people may assume, oh man, you're working with Bill and Fred, that just must be hilarious all day long, constantly making jokes, and it, it is pretty funny, but it's moments like that where you're more stunned at having these conversations that are these emotional points that are, you know, um, this season, there was a moment in one of our episodes called Salesman where Bill had a similar observation that I think that my character has more of an emotional relationship with Fred's character than was on the page. So we need to kind of refine how we're doing this. And that's the kind of conversation that, you know, I think, Rarely would happen at Saturday Night Live in the middle of a filming that sketch, and maybe some yeah. people uh, would be surprised to hear that it's happening in the middle of some, you know, what they see as, oh, it's, you know, really funny sketch kind of comedy dudes. But that's really the joy of this show is that, you know, these guys are really acting. They're really showing, you know, they're funny, but man, some of these scenes are really, really well well performed. Well, I, I, Fred Arneson, in particular, and Globesman, the salesman. The one we did that he's fantastic in that. He's really good and really played it straight. And even the moments that are played for comedy, he played it how a real guy would do it instead of trying to goose it with something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's fine, like, because I think we do take broad, there are broad jokes in, in a lot of our episodes, but um, I feel like when we do do them, they, they usually. And uh, you know, like you, you walk it there with some sense of reality that's not just a complete, you know, like whether it is just the fact that the character itself earns that quality of being broad, um, you know, because it, because they're inherently a little crazy presented, but you know, that we can't just, we don't, I, I think what I enjoy about the show is that it's, it's never comes from a place of just a joke for joke's sake. Like we really do try to be careful about making sure we don't break the reality of, of what we're doing, um, when things jump out, it, it, you really feel it um, a lot more. And I think, um, like, Blue Jeans Committee, uh, like, I, I've spoken with Fred twice um, for Portlandia, and it seems like one of the things he loves talking about the mo most is music and bands and all that sort of stuff. He must have been in his element with that episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, he wrote... Most of the songs were this guy John Sperney and yeah and uh, now yeah Fred really understood his character too. This new season we do Talking Heads, uh, this band called Test Pattern, and and uh, he's the same way. You know, very he just knows that world uh, and has a real affinity for it and a real love for it. You know, he never wants to. In Blue Jean Committee, when he has that, there's a great moment in Blue Jean Committee where he says, all you, all you want to talk about is Gene, remember that? Mm -hmm. Why don't you guys want to talk about how the blues related to and that became yeah. rock and roll? But that is just Fred. Yeah. That is Fred. Like, he just gets that guy, and I'm sure some, maybe part of Fred, like, really feels that way. But he understood that emotion of, you know, whatever. It's been 40 years, and you just want to talk about this guy who I haven't worked with in 20 years or whatever. <laughs> you know, like, why can't we just talk about something else? Like, why can't we just talk about the music and mm -hmm. talk about, the, you know, it was on point story-wise, but it was on point for that character. You know, that's, to do that and then work on those different levels, I mean, that's, that's really, really, that's talent. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, what, what, Bill, what's your favorite thing about working with Fred? Fred? Yeah. I think we just have a lot of fun together, and I, I feel like the best thing about working with Fred, it happened our first day at SNL together. It was just effortless. It was just this effortless kind of energy. You know, we both found the same things funny. Uh, I think we perform the same, kind of more characters, doing voices and things, so it, it just, you know, kind of worked out. I'm tall. He's <laughs> kind of smart. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just... It all just, people just immediately started putting us together in scenes, you know, and it was always fun. It was never hard. And then we started writing stuff together and it came really easily. And I think our approach to working at SNL was very similar as well, which was we just liked ensemble comedy. We loved working with other people and we had the same, um, kind of, you know, inspirations as far as comedy was concerned, you know, it just, just clicked. So, um, just, it was easy. And then on documentary now, uh, um, what I like about it too, and, and it's never in a competitive way, but it's like pushing each other in a way. I'll see Fred, like the scene I just described from Blue Jean Committee, I saw Fred do that, or I saw a clip from it, and I went, oh man, I really gotta bring it when I do my thing, because Fred's really, going for it, you know what I mean? And, and when we were shooting the Salesman episode, Globesman, I'm like, wow, Fred's really doing amazing work here. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find a character. I gotta do something, you know? And I stay up at night thinking about it. Like, what am I gonna do tomorrow? Because I gotta be at the same level he's at, you know? And But it's never shitty, you know? It's never uh, competitive or spiteful or anything like that. It's never out of insecurity, you know, it's just wanting the best thing. But you could also make that to what these guys are doing and what our production designer Katie's doing and everyone's doing. You, you walk in on these sets and you just go, oh my, you know, you walk in on the Sandy Passage set, you walk into that house and you're like, oh my God, so much work went into this. Um, so I want to be able to, you know, match that. I need to bring my best work, you know. Bill and Alex, what do you think uh, is something that Fred brings to the show and something that Bill brings to the show that are different things? Like, how did they complement each other well on this show? Um, well, it's funny. I think that an energy that maybe unconsciously ar arises in a few of the episodes, I mean, you know, Blue Jean Committee and Salesman, for example, is there is, I think it goes to Bill being tall and Fred being short. <laughs> <laughs> is that it, does tend, it does tend to be a sort of an alpha, um, you know, Bill, Bill's character does tend to sort of drive things, or at least on the surface, uh, you know, be driving things, and, and Fred tends to sort of favor playing a more passive role, and I think, you know, that, that sort of energy has sort of worked in our favor a, a few times, because then you can sort of, you know, un undercut um, some of the drive Bill's character with, you know, with a sort of, again, it does sometimes land in a sort of sad place with, with the way Fred plays characters because uh, he also, you know, but the, th the funny thing about Fred as well is like he's conflict averse, like I, I feel like whenever we're sort of driving towards, I think your natural tendency in writing a story or is, is you, you know, you want to find conflict between characters and really sort of push that. And Fred, Fred, in Blue Jean Committee, we, I think we pushed it a lot further and Fred found a way to sort of translate that into again, more of a sympathetic, um, you know, like they, that scene between them, Fred could have sort of walked in and, and we could have played it that Fred had, you know, wanted to unload his Yeah, he had a big uh, chip on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah but, it, but instead, that's what's really uncomfortable about conversations. They don't ever talk about what happened. Uh, it's just this uncomfortable staccato. And then making promises that you're never going to, like, I'll see you in Chicago and you're like, oh, they're never going to yeah. talk to each other. Yeah. But that's that is a good point. I think Fred does he doesn't really in life and and comedy like things that have um, conflict, and so it's always this way of of uh, and I do, you know. <laughs> so it's like it brings this interesting energy to it, you know. Yeah, it's really it's interesting because it's it's two different. They're like physically they're very different, which is very fun. Um, while they're well matched. Uh, that sense of, of 
there's a bravery in willing to be conflict averse and there's a bravery in being aggressively conflict oriented you know while being funny and they match each other really really well what what do you think um what what do you guys think what was the funnest or funniest sort of moment of shooting um documentary now uh i don't know what was I feel like there's day, you know, I mean, there are days where it's more like what, I do feel like there's moments that are energy, like for example, on Sunday Passage when you guys were doing the Obama bit. Yeah, we would do bits. <laughs> it's never like stuff that ends up in the thing, like, because, but we were doing it, me and Fred would just keep doing bits forever. We did one about Obama giving a speech about his time in Los Angeles. That is still, it's still going, right? It's like a thing, like Fred will call me up and I'll make up my phone and be like, I went down to Pig's Hot Dogs or like whatever. He just, we, it's just a thing we've kept doing. And like, that'll make that. everyone laugh. Well, that was, uh, that was why we were shooting the sort of bloody ending of Sandy Passage. Uh, so we were kind of in the, in the sort of, you know, the house is all dimly lit and, and we're trying to sort of set this moody tone. And it was, you know, so there's players play as this one single shot. So there's a lot of, um, things to work out, and sort of while that's happening, these guys are doing the Obama thing. We're just doing dueling Obama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, stuff like that, or, I, I don't know, there's also moments, uh, uh, we just did this War Room one, and uh, for me, walking in on the set of the War Room and seeing what an amazing job our production designers did, and that gives you such a, I don't know, I just got a real jolt when I walked into that set and went, wow, like we're fucking doing it, or you yeah. see, or, um, the test pattern yeah, the concert. concert. Yeah. We did a test pattern concert and you just go like, this is great. Or watching the first cut of um, I Doesn't Lie, the blue the thin blue line one, that made me laugh. That and, just, and you were just like, This is an actual episode of television. <laughs> <laughs> the day that we did the both of your interviews on I Doesn't Lie, I remember that I remember laughing really, really hard and in particular that <laughs> Fred coming back in the door at the end. Oh yeah, we couldn't oh, get through it. it. It's not in the episode because we can never, <laughs> we can never, I could never get through it because I kept laughing. The <laughs> idea was that Fred, in the middle of my interview, he came in and yelled at the <laughs> camera crew because he was waiting to do his interview. <laughs> Bro. Bro. <laughs> He's like, you know, when you tell someone you're gonna do an interview, you know, I have, I, you know, you do it at, at the exact time. You don't just, you know, it's 15 minutes late, and this is very rude. This is very, you know. Well, they're going to throw a birthday party. He goes, the guys. Yeah, there's a birthday party happening for one of the guys. He goes, look, Carlos has a birthday party, and I have stuff to do for it. You guys really? And then I remember one time he came in, and he was holding a banana. <laughs> and he was holding a banana, and I said, what's that? And he goes, this is my breakfast. <laughs> I love it. I, we never got through it. I don't think it ever ended up in that. We tried we using the credits at one point. Yeah, we could, it, I'm smiling through the whole thing. I just could not. It was such a funny thing that we're on death row and he's like trying to keep like the <laughs> schedule. <laughs> still, still being as annoying as he possibly could be. Like, tell someone that you're going to interview them at 11. You interview them at 11. You don't let it go to 11.15, 11.20. I mean, this is very rude. <laughs> Yeah, the, I think like the amazing thing about this show is that you have so much freedom and can play with so many different types of stories and shooting styles and filming things. Um, but at the same time, once you've picked what documentary you're doing, you're then sort of locked in to sort of, okay, this is the format we're going with. This is the type of story we're telling. What's it like sort of having that freedom, but then sort of, having to work around the sort of parameters of a doc, that particular sort of docu mockumentary once you're, once you're in there. Uh, I think it's really helpful actually that, you know, that you do, those documentaries do give you, give you confines in, in the shooting style and, and the language, you know, of it. But Sandy Passage is a good example because it was the first one we shot and, and sort of realizing that, that, you know, the conceit is that there's one camera uh, and you know one sound guy and so that you know there can only ever be one camera position and sort of 
settling into that confine, like you know, if we're going to put it, make a cut, it's going to be a jump cut within the scene because there's no way that there was any coverage. You know, and there's a million examples in a lot of the films we've done that, that finding that sort of language helps you sort of find the rhythm of the scene. Yeah, I, I think that you know, it's funny. We, we all approach uh, what we do uh, with a with a real appreciation for for filmmaking and, and something that. Bill has really impressed upon me over the years is the idea that comedy doesn't have to look like comedy, that comedy can be cinematic and it can be filmic, and it has informed our approach such that, you know, when you approach one of these episodes, you know, I mean, I think on the surface it might start to sound really technical, or we, we try to use the same lenses and we try to use the same lighting and we try to adhere to the same sort of dogma of the original documentary, and, and for some people that sounds really, oh, you guys are just kind of tech nerding out, but honestly, it makes it easier. It, it, it makes it easier and truer and when you have those rules and you know when it's right and you know, well, I, I know that it's right because it looks exactly like what we wanted. And so it, it, there's almost a freedom in that because it isn't just, well, it could be anything. Well, it couldn't be anything. It has, to, it has to be this thing that we're trying to do. And so by you, having those rules, it kind of frees you up to, you know, to your, your creative mind can doesn't have to expend all this energy kind of sifting through, well, God, it could be anything, so I gotta spend all day thinking about how we're gonna shoot it. Well, no, we watch the documentary, you know exactly how you're gonna shoot it. Mm. For, like, to, to wrap up, guys, is there a documentary, I would like each of you to answer this, what documentary thing would be the most challenging or the toughest documentary for you guys to take on and try to, try to do? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 one that you haven't done yet. Um, um, but you can also uh, say I, <laughs> one that you've done as well. If one was you're particularly, uh, like, I can't believe I, we did that. We're all uh, uh, know and are friends with a, a really great documentary filmmaker named Joe Berlinger, who made an incredible documentary called Paradise Lost. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's <laughs> a rough one. <laughs> that would be about the childhood murder. Yeah, of child days. murders and yeah. I, I remember, remember we were like, oh, can we do Paradise Lost? I haven't seen it. No, 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 yeah. we're, we're not doing this. This is awful. I never want to watch this footage ever again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, people go, uh, I, I, we tried to do, um, I think the ones that I always feel like are the hardest are, are um, uh, ones that are already kind of funny. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like people go, well, you should do Michael Moore or Martin, Martin Spurlock or something like that. But I, I'm like, well, that's already funny. You know, what are you... You know, what, are we doing? what are we doing then, you know? And um, like this season we're doing Kid Stays in the Picture, which is the rise and fall or whatever of Robert Evans, but the style is the first one that, you know, did that kind of 2D style. I feel like that's the first one that so I really like noticed. It, yeah, there's a whole film, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, but the story is these guys we were all talking was like, the, it's, it is funny, you know, it's a documentary you laugh at. So our documentary has to be crazier than that if you're going to do a parody of it, you know. So um, it's easier when you're doing stuff like Thin Blue Line or, um, you know, uh, you know things like, but I don't know, Great Gardens is funny. The, the, blue, the, the history of the Eagles had funny stuff in it. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to say that the, the, this the Mr. Rock episode that we're doing is probably one that we and underestimated how hard it was going to be to make. Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah. it, it's, it's involved basically shooting thousands of photographs of Bill at various stages in life of this uh, fake Hollywood producer. Uh, yeah, it, in hindsight, we could have made our lives easier <laughs> by choosing something else. Yeah, yeah, hindsight. <laughs> there was another thing that has emerged uh, that I hadn't quite realized when we got into this was, you know, the the issue based type documentary, you know, the Alex Gibney, Charles Ferguson type yeah. film, which is super popular and, and everybody knows a lot of those films very well, but it's really hard to crack something like that when they're not based in like characters. It's more issue based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we've been gravitating towards it very naturally is well there's a really great character for Bill to play, there's a really great character for Fred to play. They play off of each other. And that does narrow down. Yeah, that's true. You know, Profiles of people are easier because that's an emotional thing. But if you're going to do, it'd be harder to 
to do, uh, what was that? Let's give me one. I want to ask her about the financial crisis. Inside job. Yeah. 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 It'd be harder to do like a front line or an inside job, which we talked about. We tried also doing, um, there's ones we just didn't crack. We tried yeah. doing a uh, staircase. Yeah. yeah. That didn't work. A part of it, I think, it, yeah, because that one was, again, it's such a crazy story uh, when you start really breaking down the beats of what the actual story is that, again, we kind of kept finding ways to push it to a crazy place. And it just was the same joke over and over again, yeah. which was Fred's clearly in his, clearly guilty, but he's saying he's innocent. Yeah. 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 I think the running time as well affects some of it. But we've, I think the character-based stories are the ones that you can settle into quicker um, than, yeah, trying to sort of lay the groundwork of, of some... So, you know, ultimately yeah, reality where this is an issue. Or, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Like, I think like even on like Bill's point about the comedy sort of documentaries being harder to spoof, I imagine that's like, was even similar on SNL where doing a sketch on a comedy film was probably harder than doing one on a drama. Um, yeah. I don't think we did a lot of comedy. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, you would, you would be, there would be something in the news that was funny mm -hmm. that you would do, and I would find myself just saying the things that the guy actually said. <laughs> like Rick Perry when he was drunk, and mm -hmm. I remember we were writing all these lines, and then they said, why don't you just say what he actually said? And when I said it, the audience went bananas. They were like, ah, <laughs> oh, that's what he said. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm like, that's what I was thinking. Well, that's just what he said. And they're like, ah, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and they're like, well, I'm not getting no joke. What are we doing? Uh, but yeah, it tends to be more, more fun for us to take something that has a little bit more uh, gravitas mm -hmm. to it and poke a hole in it, you know. Yeah, I think like um like a lot of people are saying have been saying like Donald Trump's been a sort of gold mine for the lights and stuff like that. But I've found that the like in some ways it's harder to make jokes about something that is so absurd already. Well, have you seen uh, those, those Peter Serafinowitz? Oh uh, uh, yeah, those <laughs> are did you see Peter Ferris? So Peter Serafinowitz, did I send that to you guys? Uh, I don't. I mean, I'm just been sitting. Oh about my that. gosh, Peter Serafinowitz did these. Donald Trump, like sassy Donald Trump, <laughs> where he doesn't change any of his dialogue. He just loops him with kind of like a voice, like, <laughs> okay, you got it. And it is, it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Because the way he moves, You start seeing his gestures. You start seeing his gestures. He's like, well, we won. And I would, you know, and it's just, you should look him up. It's, yeah, uh, yeah super, super funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Peter, Peter Serafinowitz's Donald Trump video is really funny. But that's the kind of stuff I like instead of like, like just that. Right. You just take that and you just change his voice, but let it just be exactly what he right. said. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that's brilliant. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, instead of trying to make a joke out of what. You yeah, it's almost, I find it's 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 really funny when you see a guy in like tan makeup with like a big Trump wig. Doing a Trump impression, but like yeah. Sarah Furno, it's just doing his voice is the funniest thing. You I've see, ever seen. and it is him. Yeah, and it is him talking. It's yeah. the best. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks guys so much for chatting. Documentary now. Congratulations on your Emmy nomination. Hopefully, it will. I will, uh, hope that you uh, can uh, win on Emmy night. That'll be exciting. Uh, thanks for chatting with us, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay.